questions. I don't know if you want to get started. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. I uh, really appreciate everyone coming together so that we can get some questions answered, uh, especially with regards to prorating your materials and your uh, personnel. There are a lot of one-off situations that folks have um, and, and complicated invoicing questions that folks have, and hopefully we can all learn from each other and um, this will start the conversation. We'll learn from each other as the grant progresses and we'll uh, start the conversation now because there will be a lot of questions about invoicing through the months. Just to introduce myself, my name is Natalie Owens. I am the coordinator for this grant and Shelly is my direct supervisor. We work with, under the DOE's Federal Emergency Relief Programs. So Natalie, you don't have your sh share screen on. Would you like to share your screen while you walk through the PowerPoint? Yes, please. I thought I was. Now we see it. Thank you. Okay. I wanted to take a second and congratulate everyone. Um, we had 113 applicants and 66 awardees. Uh, there was a lot of competition this year, and there's a lot of motivation to help students uh, recover from the pandemic. Outdoor learning has become more and more critical to help those students. Shelly, can you? admit folks do you have that ability i do i will okay. continue to do so okay um in everyone's application a huge part a, a common theme was advocating for students and um helping them recover in our post pandemic world shelly and i are here to ease the point of this conversation today is to ease the paperwork so that your applicant leads and educators can get out and help the students. Um, I'm going to give you a brief, brief run through on what the state procurement process is in regards to your grant, this grant, and what to expect for the payment process. How it's handled if a budget category, excuse me, sorry, the budget category is exceeded. Uh, that's a common a common scenario it happens we want to set things correctly it set up the budgets correctly from the get-go and um, we'll talk more about that reimbursement for accruals and subscriptions um again going back to that pro rating situation um how to fill out the invoice cover page and then what documentation is required for your invoicing so at this stage, I'm drafting all the contracts. And then it goes, it moves on to Shelly along with uh, five other managers. And the sixth one signs the contract. Please know that as soon as step one, so step two can take uh, four to six weeks. Um, when and when I pass it on to Shelly, when I go into when I'm done with it and I pass it on to step two, I'll confirm with the application lead that it has moved forward and that we're four to six weeks out from here. Um, when my DOE manager signs the contract, I send it to the applicant lead via DocuSign. You guys reach out with questions, concerns, that sort of thing, um, and we proceed with your, you know, eventually your signature comes back to us. And then I can submit it to state procurement. So procurement reviews it for their legal stance, from their legal stance. And as soon as they approve it, that's when we have the ability to start paying invoices. Um, the invoice process is going to be 
when your outstanding um, expenses exceed $5,000, you can invoice monthly based on alphabetical order. So, and this, I'm sorry, the screenshot submitted invoices to the to submit invoices to the department is in your contract. And um, it spells out which names I'm looking for. So the reason why I did this um, Friday due date is so that I have a way of prioritizing. Um, legally, the state payment terms are 90, excuse me, are 30 days. The reality is that we are having staffing difficulties and turnover just like everyone else. And um, this, to boot, this grant, just like you and I, is adding to our existing workload. It will add to our accountant's existing workload. And I figure everyone's going, on average, uh, the average organization's going to invoice three times. That's 200 invoices that are being added to a workload. Um, I just want to emphasize th the reason why I'm bringing this up is so that everyone knows up front payments are extremely slow. There's no secret. Um, they're paid on a first come first serve basis and we don't have the power to expedite payments. To give you an example, currently with my reoccurring everyday vendors, it's six to nine weeks after they give me a correct error-free invoice that they get paid. Um, I'm really bringing this to folks' attention that are taking on loans and credit cards to pay for this grant. I want you to know that and plan accordingly for your interest fees. So Natalie, we do have a hand raised. I also encourage participants to put their name and affiliate in the chat box so they could introduce themselves to everyone who's here. Um, and Jill does have her hand on up. Um, so maybe we can take that question at the moment. Sure. Thanks. Um, two quick questions, Natalie. One is, do we have to wait until we sign the contract before we can start spending on the grant? Or can we start at this point? Um, and then are we guaranteed that we're getting the full award? Shelly, do you want to take this one? Sure. I do know that there's still some folks coming in in the lobby from the lobby. Yeah. So if you don't mind keeping your eye on that, that'd be great. So I, I think there's a risk in embarking on expenses that you not that you have not defined yet in your sub award agreement. So, and, and Jill, I know you're from a school district, so you're familiar with other federal funds. And, um, but to really make it clear is we are, we are only allowed to engage in reimbursement of expenses that are approved in your contract. So your contract is that, that item that dictates what we will eventually see for reimbursement requests. So, I'll give a couple situations. There, there may be a request for a hundred backpacks for an adventure, and you only have 50 kids registered for that item through your narrative. That's one item that we might question the cost. You could go out and buy a hundred backpacks because you see that there's backpacks in your RFA application. But until you know in your contract what we are going to have as approved expenses, the entity is taking on that risk that not everything may be reimbursed. So depending on the risk level in which the entity determines they want to embark on is really at the discretion of the subawardee. All right, switching back. So a huge lesson learned from last year was setting the budgets up correctly from the from the get go. And the largest obstacle was how are you paying your folks? Are you are they contracted services or personnel? Um, and as I described, so if they're getting a W-2, 
your budget, the budget to pay for them should come out of the personnel budget if they're getting a 1099 or just a plain check because um, somebody, maybe there's a volunteer situation and you're giving them a small stipend. They're not on your payroll. The budget for those folks need to be in contracted services. The um, just one sec. So I'll monitor the chat box for you, Natalie. Thanks. I'll respond to questions that I can, and then we'll come back to those questions in the chat box at the end so we can respond to them orally so that everybody has the, the information. Sounds good. I want I wanted to make sure everyone knew where the budget was in your contract. It's all the way down. So um, Somali Bantu is the first uh, awardee that has had a like both part. Excuse me. Both parties have signed the contract, and we're both very excited. And um, that's the example that I'm using today. So your budget is pretty far down. Okay. So on. For this instance, it's page 10. I would say on average, it's between page 8 and 12. I just want just so that you folks can find it. Um, from the state's perspective, if more than 10% of budget needs to transfer, it's considered a change. It, it constitutes a change in the scope of work, and therefore we have to amend the contract. Um, let's say so 10% of your transportation budget, your budget goes over on transportation and you want to take um, $500 from contracted services, so that's more than 10%. So we have to do a contract amendment uh, in order to move that funding. Um, again, the biggest obstacle we found with this was how are you going to pay people contracted or personnel or um, W-2? Um, this additional paperwork at, I mean, basically, we're starting the contract process over. It's additional weeks to, um, to get this done, and we can't pay anyone until that amendment is done. It means several or a couple conversations, some emails, and then I write the amendment. From there, um, it picks up this, the procurement process of it goes to Shelly and a bunch of people. And then it goes to you guys to sign, and then it goes to the state procurement process, has to be approved, and then we can process invoices. Um, as circumstances unroll, please reach out as soon as possible. That's um, that's it. That's the last. All right. Um, So there are two types of accounting systems, accrual-based and cash-based. We can only reimburse on the cash basis. Um, meaning not until the service is provided. And this especially becomes sticky when you have accrued salaries and when you have subscriptions. So you'll charge us for your salaries after the service is completed. And the subscriptions, main gear and um, was a common one, main gear share and um, GPS subscriptions. A lot of there are a lot of annual things, and you're going to prorate it for the length of the of the contract, and invoice it after you've used the service. Um, I could give an example. I'll, I'll go ahead and give an example. Um, your organization has a annual subscription to main gear share, but you're not using it until you're not using the, those items um, for the grant until the summer. So you would invoice a prorated amount after they are used. 
Kelly, do you want to take this one? I'll let folks in. Yeah, great. So we know based on the review of all of your applications that there may be some purchases that equate to equipment. Equipment at a federal level is $5,000 or more per unit. So what we're, what is a requirement of this federally funded program is that all of the equipment purchases be inventory. Statue is very clear about what needs to be on your inventory list, as well as how those items need to be denoted and marked and tagged. We also call it tagged. So we provided you the list that would meet the standard requirements of the federal government. So it would have a unique inventory number, a description, a model, make, and serial number, the vendor in which was purchased, the acquisition date, the cost per unit, the condition of the property, the fiscal location, and how it's being safeguarded. So we, we have a picture here and all of the photos in our slide deck today are actual photos from past programs, which for me is a highlight of the work that we do. But you can see here a few kiddos carrying uh, a sea kayak and that item may have been purchased or utilized for programming in the past. And, and what that kayak will have is a tag on it that denotes that it was paid with federal funds. And in the office, for example, you'll have potentially uh, a spreadsheet or an Excel file or uh, a QuickBook kind of item that you will go through and you'll, you can say, all right, I have two kayaks. This is where they are. This is the condition they're in. And here's the unique identifying number. So all of the information that you see on the screen for the way in which the property needs to be inventoried does not necessarily need to be on your tag. But if you're looking for additional information about what this requirement entails, if you're new to this work, you're gonna to wanna to see Rider H and Rider I in your contract. That's where we talk about the, the federal threshold. We talk about the requirements of the inventory list and also some other information about what will be needed at the end of your programming so that we have a detailed list. Again, if there are equipment purchases, the equipment must be used for the allowable use identified in your application and in the contract for the end of time. So really thinking about what that means for your program and how you're gonna navigate being sure that on a yearly basis, either, even after the funding has expired, you're still going to need to maintain this information on that property that was purchased, that equipment that was purchased. Okay, so the invoice cover page, this DOE, this page with the DOE logo is going to be your cover page for each invoice package. And these details need to come, is that too small? These details need to come directly from your contract. So I just wanted to show you where um, this, uh, this data being incorrect is very common um, and further delays payment. Uh, if we don't catch the problem, the accountant will 100% of the time catch the discrepancy and kick it back. So here again is um, our recently fully signed uh, contract and the advantage contract number is up here. And then on your Excel, on the DOE invoice, it goes over here. I know I can't highlight. Um, here I can do a better job. So the very first page of each contract has the advantage contract number, and that goes over here. The vendor name has to be exactly as it's typed down here. Even if you have initials, it, it doesn't matter. The address um, last year, not having the correct address on here, if the address on here and the contract need to match or else payment got delayed, it was after Christmas. So it causes huge problems. Um, it, 
And then the vendor number has to be identical on the contract and on your template. Now I wanted to dig in more on this um, Excel file. Everyone's going to get this. And as it's updated, as more examples come through, um, I'll circulate it again. But I've tried to be concise and thorough, which isn't very easy for me, um, to give you directions on what documentation, what backup we need. And Again, the personnel and the contracted services is already is always the wonkiest one. Um, I don't want to just read this to you guys. So maybe we should go ahead and take questions, I guess. So I think some of the key highlights on the the example that um, Natalie has in front of you is every single expense is going to need to be denoted with what we refer to as compliance documentation. So whether it's it's a, a personnel like a salary and or um, backpacks that were purchased as a supply, all of those purchases with the vendor name, the purchase date, and the payment date are going to be needed as what we refer to as, a, as an accounting system. We refer to it as a trial balance. So as you can see, there's um, the requirement to have an item that denotes all of your expenses. And then what, what I refer to as the compliance documentation, the backup to show that those items were purchased for the programming in the approved application. There were a few questions in regard to particular so I know there was a question about student stipends, and if that was participant stipends, would that be categorized as contracted services? So Natalie is going to show you exactly where those would be classified. There is a category called student scholarships or stipends. Again, we really want that compliance documentation to show that they were paid out and that the, the sub-awardee also made that payment. So we work on a reimbursement model, as Natalie mentioned at the top of our hour, and that is essentially the, the payment, the cost has to have occurred before you, you can request reimbursement for that cost. Every invoice, and, and I'm going to tie this into another question that I saw in the chat box that I think I responded to, um, every contract is as it is, it's a contract. It is not an allocation that we are operating through Grants for Me or through GEM. This is a, a separate entity than, than either one of those portals. So what will happen is you will provide your cover page. Natalie, can you toggle to that cover page for just a moment? You will provide this cover page your detailed expenditures, and then the compliance documentation associated with those expenses. And I just called it a detailed uh, expenditure report instead of a trial balance, because I know every, every entity in our awardees is going to have a different type of system that they utilize. But essentially, we need that documentation that shows the date, the type of expense, the amount, and when it was paid out. Now, if you could just scroll down to the bottom, I think we want to hit a few of those things right there in between lines 19 and below. So I indicated that this program is not being operated through GEMS or grants for me. Those are systems that we utilize for other, pro other federal programs primarily to SAUs in uh, title work or other emergency relief funding, but separate pot of funds structured a little bit differently. So 
every item will be in one PDF that you will send to Natalie. And I, I think I did provide her email in the chat box to the question that was there. Other things that we want to highlight here is the process will be faster in the review if you tie in each dollar on your trial balance to your compliance documentation and, and be sure that that is all correlated and that you have identified each of those expenses and that they match and align. That will help to, to, inc to increase the speed in which the review can be done. The other component is, I know we talked about, there was a question in the chat box about April programming. What we are doing collectively as a team, we made the commitment to, to try to process and create contracts for the programming that is happening sooner than other programming. So for example, if you have an April program uh, that was proposed in your application, we are doing our very best to be sure that you have a contract that you can review here very shortly and engage in, in the work that you need to do to have a successful April program. That will mean that our summer programming will be a little further out. So hopefully we all have an understanding in the patients to be able to see that there are programming that is happening prior to, and we're trying to prioritize in that chronological order. Again, we're talking about programming that might happen in FY24 or FY25, 23, 24, excuse me. And what we want to be sure that you're aware of, if you have programming that spans the fiscal years, your invoices cannot span fiscal years. So our fiscal years run from July 1st to June 30th. So any expenses that might transpire June, July, August, we need to be sure that those are separated out. The other thing, Natalie, I know that there was a question in the chat box. Um, can you go back to the slide that has the weeks in which the invoices must be submitted? Certainly. There we go. So there was a, a question related to um, how do we invoice for months included our, in our application that have already passed? I'm going to tie it into the slide that Natalie's sharing here. On the bottom left-hand side, you can see that the way in which we can structure an effective process for all of our awardees is really to define a time window in which you are going to be submitting your invoices to Natalie. Because as you, as Natalie mentioned, we have over 65 awardees. We need to be able to process that as, as effectively as possible. So you should be submitting invoices on a monthly basis if your monthly expenses exceed $5,000. And also, you should be aware of what your legal entity or doing business as name is, because that will fall into which Friday that you're going to submit those invoices. Again, these invoices are submitted directly to Natalie at her email address. And uh, I'm just kind of circling back to what that timeline looks like. Now I'm on, now I'm going to pause for just a moment to see if there's some questions in the chat box that we didn't get to. Oh yes, there is another budget question that I was attempting to write a response to, but ran out of time. Um, what is the process for changing items within a budget category? So Natalie, can you um, return to the invoice, the last slide essentially that we had here? One more so um, oh but, um which one what? that one which, thank you one. that's not okay. a slide that's an excel sheet okay so right. what happens is in your contract natalie mentioned you have a budget and she identified where to locate it within that contract there's going to be specific dollar values associated with the categories that we have here personnel materials, non-instructional materials, contracted services, transportation, and then there's two other budget categories after that. So essentially what happens is we have a 10% rule 
So you can you can work within your budget category to the level of exceeding overage of 10%. Once you've met that threshold of any of these budget categories, we are going to need to have a revision to your contract because again, your contract is that signed agreement. Those are the expenses that we are going to be able to reimburse you for. So once there's a need for a change, you're going to need to reach out to Natalie and you folks are going to need to work with Natalie to identify what those changes are. It is an entire cycle again, meaning the entire review process happens, the revision of the contract happens, it goes through the review process, it gets submitted, and then it gets approved, re-approved essentially, and then you can navigate the new budget once it's been approved. You should not be navigating new budgets without anything signed. Again, it goes back to that level of risk that the entity is taking on by working outside of the parameters that have been both mutually agreed upon in your contract. I just want to ram home um, getting these budgets set up as correctly as possible and slowing down the I'm not slowing it down. I'm I keep double checking with folks. There's a lot of back and forth that I put in intentionally into our conversations to make sure that these budgets aren't going to change because it becomes painful when um, to amend. I anticipate contracts needing to be amended, but that's going to further delay everything. So that's why it's four to six weeks for the reason being these budgets one reason being that these budgets needs need to be set up as well as possible from the get-go and i also appreciate that you guys don't know how to how to come within the confines of the state procurement budgeting category so we have to have those conversations for a reason um the state the student scholarships that's a great example um and the stipends Yes, they're going to be paid either by 1099s or W2s, but we still have a separate budget for them because this pro this grant is tr is highlighting. We need those funds highlighted to see what um, to what scholarships tuition that we pay directly to or I'm sorry, directly for we're we're keeping them separate so we have a way to measure our impact. Um, the stipends. For students, we know that these are the this is this population is the same population that often needs to bring in income for their families during the summer, and that this this program is taking the place of that. We want to be able to measure that. So back to just to ram it home um, on these budget categories. That's why I'm working with folks. That's why these contracts aren't getting done faster. Why we can't say. Um, what your dollar amount of approval is and if each budget cat like I can't say very much via email until I look at it because a lot of shuffles need to happen before I have anything that I can pass on to management for approval. All right, I've talked enough about that. What else? So I think Natalie, if you go ahead and unshare your screen, we can run through the questions that we may not have responded to. I, I do want to, um, unless there was other items, I, I don't think there was anything else in the PowerPoint in particular. Was there anything else in the PowerPoint you wanted to share? There wasn't. Um, in this Excel file that I'm going to circulate to everyone is a good example for how to handle it with per diem if you have an overnight program, then there are GSA, uh, there are government rates that we have to hold to. And so I do have an example of that within the Excel file. I don't want to read what's in the Excel file to you guys. You'll look at it and um, send me questions accordingly, I'm sure. Uh, I, so I didn't have anything necessarily. Great. So I'll run through the questions. Um, and if there's ones that you particularly want to take, Natalie, go ahead and jump right in. Um, so the first question, will our award be the full amount in our application? I did address that in the chat box. Every request 
is being reviewed for reasonableness necessary and allowable or uh, allocable, which is a, a federal term that is used. So your application request may not be equivalent to your contract amount. So keeping in mind the level of risk that you want to take, because I know there was another question, does this, does this mean we should not make any purchases before a contract? That again is at the discretion of the awardee if you want to take on that risk. However, the only items that we will reimburse for are the ones that are mutually agreed upon in the signed contract by both entities, the department, as well as the sub-awardee. Um, how do we invoice for months included in our application that have already passed? Uh, you will work with Natalie, but essentially your first submission will take care of all the expenses that have transpired. However, your expenses can only happen, can only transpire in your contracted date which is 2-1, February 1st, 2024, 20, onward. Uh, we did talk about the gems and grants question. We talked about the adjustments within the budgetary categories and that 10% overage. I referenced the uh, risk level associated with making purchases before a signed agreement. Will the slides be sent to us after the meeting? Um, certainly. Uh, equipment was mentioned that at a federal threshold is $5,000 per unit. So does that mean that 50 backpacks costing $75 each, for example, do not need to be inventory? Just the opposite. Um, they need to continue to be used for the original purpose that they were used. Um, and, and we, you need to know where they are and, um, you are, you remain accountable for said backpacks, life jackets, that sort of thing. All of the equipment remains property of the awardee should not be, um, should no, should not tra transfer ownership to a student, for example. So that life jacket that Natalie just mentioned is property of the awardee and must be maintained by the awardee. In regards to the equipment inventory list, you should denote all of your expenses. You should know where all those items are and what you purchased. But the ones that the US Department of Education will be looking for are those equipment purchases that meet that $5,000. But again, you should have an account of where all of your items are. We talked a little bit about the timeline in regards to contracts. Our team is prioritizing uh, earlier programming to be able to support those needs. We do hope to have all contracts crossed. Do we have a timeline for all contracts, Natalie, at this point? No. As we're, we are working as quickly as possible. Natalie highlighted the timeline and the review process, um, and we appreciate your patience with that. Related to payroll, some of the people assigned to the grant are doing their work February 15th to April 15th, setting up curriculum, advertising, buying equipment, interviewing interns. The services are done. Is it okay to ask for reimbursement? for them early on, not totally clear on the service date part. So your contract start dates will be 2-1. Again, if you do not have a signed contract, you are taking on a risk of having those items, the setup already conducted before your signed contract. What will happen is you will put all of the expenses that have incurred once you have a signed contract and know what those are, in your very first invoice submission. And that can then can begin as early as um, April, correct, Natalie? As soon as there's a mutually signed contract, you uh, um you guys can pick up wherever you are in the alphabet with whichever Friday. Um, that 
Does that make sense? So Somali Bantu is done with their contract and they probably S is probably at the last Friday of the month. So they will pick up in April. Um, their due date would be the last Friday of April. Does SAM.gov UEI need to be registered on SAM.gov or just updated every year? Do you want to take that one, Natalie? So you there's a difference it? between registered and active. Once you are registered, once you have a UEI number, you are registered. Every year you have to activate it. There's there's a difference there. And we, um, for our reporting to the federal government, we need all your UEI numbers to be active when we do that report. The question is, is the invoice template going to be sent when we receive our contract? Um, no, because the contract goes through DocuSign, so that'll be, a, it'll be a separate invoice. Um, honestly, I'm trying to circulate this file as soon as possible and as guidance gets updated it'll be recirculated so you'll have that sooner than your signed contract uh, i'll take the second part of that question is there a fund or revenue code that needs to be used so the template that natalie has has all of the accounting information that's there actually i cannot tell if you're from a school district but this funding is a separate pot of money that does not have a, a fund and revenue code. So we've provided all the specific accounting information right on that invoice template for you to use. I think I responded to the fact that contracts are not being um, developed alphabetically. They're really being developed chronologically based on program offerings. Um, so essentially there's a question and the question relates to, to backdating and I'll read it and then we'll, I'll respond to it. After the contract is signed and agreed upon, we can backdate to the date we put on our application if those budget items were approved. So if you have an item that was purchased after February 1st, which is the start of your contract date, so that will be the start date for all of our contracts in this program. That expense has already occurred and you've already as an entity paid it out. You can use that as, as an expense that you're seeking reimbursement for. So it's not essentially that you're backdating an expense, you're just including it in a reimbursement request. Have we responded to the um, past expenses in our first invoice? That is the way in which it should be processed. We will start um, accepting reimbursement requests. <laughs> Apologies. Our daily delivery. Um, when will you all start accepting reimbursement statements? And that will be as soon as the beginning of April, once you have a signed contract. Uh, fiscal years. So there's a question about can you clear up the uh, fiscal years if I have a program beginning in April and June and, and am buying equipment in June for the June program in May. That May expense is in fiscal year uh, 24. Mm -hmm. um, so anything after that purchase after July 1st would be in the new invoice submission in your July invoice or maybe even potentially your August invoice. So we just need to be sure that the uh, reimbursement request does not have FY24 expenses and FY25 expenses. To be able to process all of our awardees, we are asking that the 
invoice submissions do stay alphabetically on the Fridays in which is denoted by the awardee's name. So we we hope that you folks can honor that setup that we've designed to be able to effectively serve all of you folks in our program. Can an invoice packet be submitted on the Monday of that week versus the Friday of that week? That's fine. That, yeah, I you can submit that, it any time. The point of the alphabetical order is so that I have some way of prioritizing. You can submit an invoice at any point. I think we talked a lot about the contract date starting on February 1st and expenses happening after the fact. We do know that it's about 1020 or so. We have about 10 more minutes that will continue to address questions. However, we do know that everybody's calendar is probably double, triple booked. So we appreciate you folks joining us. If you do have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Natalie uh, and or myself. For any of those questions, what we will continue to do for the next 10 minutes is, is run through the questions we see in the chat box and hopefully we have some time to open up the floor for any additional questions. Um, I should in the PowerPoint, I should have stressed the EFT. So because payments are so delayed, you're being set up, being set up for EFT uh, or electronic payments is definitely in your best best interest. The way to know if you've been set up is in the vendor self-service portal. That's a rabbit hole we can go down. Um, I have a way of looking to see if you are set up, but I'm hoping you guys already know if you're set up and because uh, it's, it's pretty tedious trying to find it, that information, but I can't find it. If you don't spend down all the funds, um then that's fine i mean there are no repercussions to answer the question so there is a question that i I'll, I'll read but i'll also kind of elaborate a little bit more on um so it says for payment to teachers for planning and special development is there an hourly rate of pay so essentially the way the statute is written is all of your expenses with federal funds should be prudent in your common practices. So I'll give you an example associated with the question. If I would normally use my local funds or my uh, foundation funds or my donations from entities, and I would pay teachers $25 an hour for this type of work, and then you receive this award and you say, well, now's an opportunity to, to increase that pay and let's give them $50 an hour. That is not prudent practice. That is not what you would do with your other type of funding. So you want to be sure that that level of expense is prudent to your common practices. And that's the same with, uh, we talked about backpacks earlier at $75 an hour, uh, $75 a backpack, if that would be an expense that you would incur with local foundation um, donees funds, then, then it's prudent in regards to the funding that we've provided as well. However, if you would say to yourself, my goodness, I don't know if I could justify making a purchase of a backpack for $75, just as an example, because it was in the chat box. With my foundation funds, you should also make that same purchase or an equivalent purchase with federal funds. If you wouldn't pay for $75 a backpack with foundation funds, you should not be using federal funds at $75 a backpack. I know that that was not a black and white response to that particular question, but I think it's um, based on the, the individual entity. Natalie, you want to add a little to that? 
No, I'm sorry. I was just going to switch gears to another question. Okay. Um, would a list of transactions exported from a book, uh, bookkeeping software meet the requirement? Yes, definitely. The pasto, the scans of receipts, and I'm sorry, we do still need your receipts for your items, um, for your consumables. Pay stubs would be on a case by case basis. Uh, if there isn't an accounting software, if you can't show from your accounting program that when the paycheck was issued then we'll need the pay stubs. You can start invoicing the Friday after you have a signed contract. So for example, if you were the fourth Friday and you have a signed contract today, you could invoice. Well, technically. Friday of this week, and I, I can't think of the date, 28, 29, whatever Friday would be. Um, so once you have a signed contract on the Friday associated with the alphabetical order, you can start submitting your invoice. Uh, ETF, I think Natalie uh, responded to in regards to the self service vendor portal is the best way to get all of the information you need associated with ETF and if it's set up correctly. Um, if if folks sent any forms that people have sent to me, I immediately forward on to the accountant. So if you're new to EFT and I'm sorry, I didn't confirm I got flooded. So I just passed everything on to the accountant. Um, if you've submitted it to me, it's already with them. And you should be all set. If items were purchased in March, but students don't use it until June, once the expense has incurred, an invoice can be submitted, just as long as the entity has has made has incurred that expense. Are there any penalties if you're unable to utilize all of the funding that is denoted in your contract? That is an ongoing conversation that you will be having with Natalie because all of these funds will be, if they are unused, will be returned to the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and as you can imagine, we would like to utilize them and make sure that they're effective and supporting students learning and the gap established by the pandemic. So again, that will be an ongoing conversation that you have with Natalie throughout the process. Can you repeat the month for each fiscal year? The cutoff is June 30th. Tran transactions before June 30th need to be on a separate invoices for, uh, separate invoice from those that are July 1st onward. Is that so it's July July of 23 to June of 24 is one fiscal year. This is that those dates are also on the invoice template. So I read the question a little bit differently. So I just, so Natalie is absolutely correct, right? You can't span different fiscal years. So anything before June 30th is going to be on one invoice request. Anything after July 1st will be on a different invoice request. Thank you, Sarah, for the confirmation in the chat box. All right, we have a few minutes if you folks have some additional questions if you don't mind unmuting yourself and um, posing your question, that would be great. Last date for grant reimbursement. When's the last invoice that needs to be submitted, Natalie? February, February, September, uh, Friday, September 13th, and that's also on the invoice template. I'll be circulating these slides, the link to this recording and the invoice template um, by the end of the week. Really glad you found this helpful. If I get flooded with complicated questions that 
but multi from multiple people, I'll offer this again. There's no reason not to, if, if you guys find it beneficial. There was a question in regards, can we talk a little bit about procurement um, competition and that procurement policy process? So your procurement process must at a minimum meet the federal requirements. So um, there is some information in your contract associated with the federal requirements for procurement. I think, you know, knowing that we only have a couple minutes left, that's a much larger topic that we could get into. But I would encourage, if you have a specific question, um, to look into the contract first and then uh, reach out to, to Natalie if you have a specific question. Wanted to reinforce, thank you so much for putting up with the state procurement process and putting um, yourself out there for this RFA. I know a lot of folks are, this is RFAs, grant, state grants are new to them and um, congratulations, you got this far. Uh, I'm really committed to getting the paperwork straightened out so that the students can benefit from your work. And I hope you all know that. I think we'll end it on that. Take care, everybody. We'll be in.